Hi everyone and welcome to Flipping Heck Business, Flip Learning for AQA A-Level Business Studies. This is video number one of Unit 5, Decision Making to Improve Financial Performance. Okay, so what does this uh, video actually have in it? So we've got the value of setting up financial objectives, uh, distinction between cash flow and profit, uh, objectives for revenue, cash flow, investment levels and capital structure, and then influences on financial objectives themselves. So once again, if we look at uh, how this actually relates to other areas of the course, now obviously it's financial objectives, so it will link with uh, all the corporate objectives, marketing, operational, uh, the, the um, HR direct, uh, objectives as well. It also links to budgeting, shares and shareholders, and decision making as well. So whenever you've got like a bigger uh, question to do, try and link back to some of these as well. So what is a financial objective? So it's a specific goal or target relating to the financial side of a business. This can be for profit and shareholder returns, uh, cash flow targets, return on capital employed or cost minimization. So in other words, when we're talking about financial objectives, we're talking about anything to do with the money side of it. So it could be that, like it says here, we're aiming for profit, so we're looking at 5% profit increase, uh, or we're looking at being able to give out a certain amount of dividends, or we're just looking at being able to survive, so we've got our cash flow target set up. Uh, it could be a return on capital employed, so if we've put any investment in, are we getting it back? Or it could just be trying to minimise our own costs themselves. So the value of setting financial objectives is that it gives focus to the entire business. It makes sure that there's coordination, there's efficiency going on. So uh, again, you've not got like, you know, the marketing team just going off and spending everything that they want when they've been given an objective by the finance team and said, right, well, we've only got this limited amount of funds. Uh, it's an important measure of success or failure for the business. I mean, like, you know, you, you read about companies all the time. If you looked at uh, Tesco, how much profit they are making, uh, then you can see, you know, why there are certain factors where they've had like reductions in the profit that they're actually created. Um, it reduces the risk of business failure. So if you've actually got the objective set, uh, are you just surviving? When are you actually going to start making money if you're a startup business? Uh, it provides transparency for shareholders about the investment. So if you've got shareholders, they need to know the profits. Again, if we go back to Tesco, a few years back, they didn't have that transparency. And what happened? They uh, declared that there were 250 million more profit than they actually had. And people have ended up going to jail because they lied about that. Then it helps coordinate the different business functions. So again, we're getting everybody working together. And then it is a key context for making investment decisions. Okay, so if you've got profit left at the end of the year, then you can start using it for investment. If it's not there, then maybe you have to go for a loan or another source of finance. Now, there is a big difference between profit and cash flow. They are linked, but profit is basically the difference between total revenues and total costs over a period of time, where cash flow is the difference between total cash inflow and total cash outflow over a period of time. So, again, profit is kind of like what you get at the end. Cash flow is just making sure that you've got something for the day to day running. So, here is profit. So, you can see here that profit is sales minus which is less minus variable costs minus fixed costs if we add those together it's obviously total cost give you your net profit but cash flow is cash inflows some money coming in take away cash outflows money going out of the business and then that gives you your net cash flow so cash flow itself now there's a bit of a difference in the fact that like there's timings so for example sales that are made to customers on credit uh, so if you've said, right, well, you can buy some of my items and pay me back in a certain length of time, well, that's going to affect your cash flow. In the immediate effect, you're not going to have very much money, but in the long term, you'll be getting more money come back. And then also payment suppliers. So, I mean, like you flip it round and if you said, right, well, to your supplier, right, I'll pay you for these raw materials in a few months, then again, that money isn't being spent right now and it could be invested elsewhere. So the way that fixed assets are accounted for is that you've got the payment for the for a fixed asset equals cash outflow, uh, cost of fixed asset treated as a non as an asset, not a cost, and then depreciation is also charged uh, as cost when the value is of a fixed asset is reduced. So in other words, payment of fixed asset equals cash outflow when you've actually got to pay for something. 
but the cost of the asset, so it's not actually going out until it's gone, until you've actually paid the money. And then depreciation is basically where a vehicle or uh, like a uh, an item loses its value over a certain period of time. Now you need to keep a track of that because you know if you're relying on your uh, cars being worth the same amount of money year on year, then they're not going to be. And if you try to sell all those assets, you would actually make less money back on them. And then cash outflows arising from uh, sorry cash flows arising from the way the business is financed. So inflow comes from things like shareholders, uh, bank loans factoring, right? Repayments of uh, amounts loaned and then payments of dividends. So payments of dividends would be money going out. Repayments of amounts loaned would be money going out, but everything else would be inflows. So what's the real sort of difference? So here's a few examples then. So we've got a customer buys goods for £50,000 on 60 day credit. So what happens to profit in that case? So in that case, sales of £50,000 are recognized immediately. You understand that at the end of the year, your profit will have that £50,000 in sales. But with cash flow, because remember, cash flow is everything you need for the day to day running. You know, that's the actual is there money coming in? Well, the cash inflow of £50,000 will only come in when you actually get the £50,000. So you may register it as profit, but you won't be able to spend any of that money because it's not there. Uh, if there was a marketing campaign costing 10000 ordered from a marketing agency. Well, the cost of the 10,000 included in the marketing costs. So straight away in profit, you would take into that into account. And then the cash outflow of 10,000 would actually go to the agency once you have paid. And you'd be more likely to pay towards the end of the uh, campaign than you would at the beginning. Again, if we go back, uh, we've got new factory machinery bought for 150,000. So what happens to profit? Well, there's no effect. Why? Because that £150,000 profit is just added into your fixed assets. So when we're doing balance sheets, you'll see this in a lot more detail. But what it means is that that £150,000 is still a part of your business. Like, yes, you may have converted it from money to machinery, but it is still there and it should still be included. So that would actually be still a part of your profit. But your cash outflow of £150,000 will be paid to supplier of the machine. So in other words, your cash flow will see a reduction of £150,000 where your profit won't see any change. Right, depreciation charge of £100,000 to reflect use of factory fixed assets. So in other words, you've got machinery, it's getting a little bit dated now, so you reckon that it's probably worth £100,000 less than it was when you got it. So that depreciation of £100,000 needs to come off your profit. It needs to be recognized that it is no longer, if you tried to sell the machine, then you would no longer get the same amount of money for it. So you recognize that by taking it off. But your cash flow, well, nothing happens because it isn't actually money that you can spend at the moment. If you were trying to sell it, then it would add on to the cash flow. That's fair enough. But just because it's depreciation means that you won't affect your cash flow, but it will affect your profit. So how is profit measured? Now, there are three ways that we actually look at it. We've got gross profit, operating profit, and profit for the year. So if we look at this example of an income statement here, then what you can see is we have got the revenue and the cost of sales. So these two added together, which will give us then our gross profit which is 1800. So we've done this already. You've seen that like to work out our profit is revenue plus cost of sales. So things like, uh, you know, the, the cost of materials, etc., etc. Now that gives us our gross profit, which is always the highest figure. So when we're looking at that, we've got gross profit, uh, 1.8 million. Remember this is in a hundred thousand, right? So then what happens? Well, once we've actually worked out our gross profit, we know how much we're going to get in from our sales and from uh, like the, the actual production line. Then we need to take into account our administration ex expenses. So here we've got them and they are 165,000. So that's things like rent, et cetera, et cetera. I know that we're like, we've kind of looked at that in the past as uh, at a kind of basic level, but once we're starting to look at an actual income statement, then we're going to go into a bit more detail. 
So take away your administration uh, administrative uh, expenses. That gives us our total operating profit. So this is how the business is actually running from all of its expenses, etc., etc., is 1.15 million. Now, what we need to take away from that is our favorite thing, obviously, tax. So we've got tax here. And then we've got our net finance cost as well. So this is things like um, interest, uh, like any kind of expenses that are linked to borrowing itself. Which means that at the end of the day, right down here, we have our profit for the year. So even though we started up here at 1.8 million profit, well, we've taken into account our expenses, we've taken into account our finance expenses, our tax as well, and this gives us, this company, at the end of the day, has got £825,000 as profit. And this is pretty much what you have to do every single time as a business. You need to make sure that all of these figures are adding up right, so that you know exactly where your money is at each point. Okay, so first of all, what we're looking at, we look at revenue. So revenue is sales during the period. Then we've got cost of sales, so direct cost of generating revenues go into the cost of sales. So these are things like raw materials, components, good ports for resale, and direct labor cost of production. So like if it's anything that is uh, to do with uh, like overtime, etc., etc., or any kind of like um, uh, basically anything that is linked to our variable costs. So um, uh, direct labor production costs would be things like commission. And then that gives us the gross profit. So the difference between the revenue and cost of sales. Simple but very useful measure of how profit is generated from every one pound of revenue before overheads. Overheads are like any of your expenses. Right? So it, it's used really to count, calculate the gross profit margin then from that as well. So that's our first profit line. Then we go into our administration expenses, so things like operating costs that are f and expenses that are not directly related to producing the goods or services are recorded here. So that's like distribution costs, marketing, transport, wide range of administration expenses or overheads that a business occurs. And then that gives us a key measure of profit, which is our operating profit. So it records how much profit has been made in total from the trading activities of the business before taking into account how the business is financed. And then we've got finance expenses, so interest paid on bank and other borrowings, uh, less, interest in, uh, less interest income received on cash balances. So in other words, like uh, how much interest you're paying compared to how much interest is being paid back to you. Useful figure for shareholders to assess how profit is being used up by the funding structure of the business. Uh, then we've got taxation, so an estimate of the amount of corporate tax that is likely to be payable on the profit. And then that gives us our profit for the year, our net profit. So the amount of profit that is left after tax has been accounted for. So shareholders then decide how much of this is paid out to them in dividends and how much is left for the business, so retained profit. So, you know, at the end of the year, Shareholders will decide, well, how much are we actually going to get back? If they're looking for expansion, then they might have a reduced amount of dividends because they know that like, they're going to be investing a lot of money back into the business, which will give them even more in the future. So if we're looking at objectives themselves, so we've got things like revenue objectives. So these are usually set quite early by uh, most businesses. So revenue growth could be as a percentage or a value. So aiming to grow the business uh, total revenue of uh, a business by 10% or to reach 1 million in sales during a year. Then you've got sales maximization, so aim to maximize total sales. So it doesn't matter whether they're profitable sales or it just is aiming for the actual sales themselves. So going for volume rather than value. And then market share, so to grow market share to 20%. So it could be that they'll involve uh, faster revenue growth than a market competitors. So again, when you're looking at revenue objectives, it's not always going to be just about the money. It could be market share or it could be maximizing sales. Uh, cost minimization objectives. So these are where you are trying to be mo the most cost effective way of delivering goods and services to required level of quality. So in other words, what you're trying to do here is you are trying to make sure that you are spending as little as you can without putting too much strain on your quality. You've got to decide, first of all, what your actual like objective is for your product. Like, are they actually low cost? Are they expected to be lower quality? Well, if that's the case, then maybe you can like start 
you know, your custom minimization can be quite drastic. Whereas if you're expecting high quality, then it could just be a case of cutting down some small things, but still expecting to pay that quality out. So benefits of it is usually it, you'll lower your unit costs, which will make you more competitive. You can produce cheaper than your competitors. It raises up, therefore, your high gross mar uh, profit margin which will also give you a higher operating profits and then it will improve your cash flow because you're spending less but still getting the money in and then finally you'll get a higher return on investment so if you invest in machinery that makes everything cheaper to produce well that's fantastic what you might find is that it's a lot cheaper to do that than to just carry on working the way you're doing and trying to cut those costs so profit objectives so revenue and cost objectives are often set in order to support profit objectives. So the most common profit objectives are, so it's again, specific level of profit. So to achieve an operating profit of 1 million. Uh, it could be rate of profitability. So achieve an operating profit margin of 10% of revenues. So in other words, like, you know, if our sales go up, then we want to still hit 10% of it as profit. Or if they went down, then we're still actually getting that 10% of profit. Uh, profit maximization, so to maximize the total profit for the year, uh, or to exceed industry or market profit margins. So in other words, to beat your competitors. So possible cash flow objectives would be things like uh, reduce borrowings to target levels. So again, not borrow too much money from uh, outside sources such as banks or from um, your, your suppliers. To minimize interest costs, so in other words, maybe you might want to consolidate a lot of loans into one, which will give you a lower overall interest rate. Uh, reduced amounts held in inventories or owed by customers, so think back to the lean, uh, to, uh, lean production. So if you are reducing the amount held in your inventory, then you are obviously going to improve your cash flow because you can sell off like unwanted assets. Or like if you've got a lot owed by customers to you, well, you need to start collecting that in. Reduce seasonal swings in cash flow. So in other words, make sure that you've uh, you know, got a fairly steady cash flow throughout the year. And then net cash flow as a percentage of the net profit. So e.g. 90% off operating profit. So you might actually want to constantly have the cash flow set at a decent level so that like, you know, out of all the operating profit that is coming in, 90% of it is available at any one time. So next we're looking at business investment. So what is investment? So capital expenditure on items such as product, machinery, IT systems, buildings, etc. So where you're actually like going to get new capital into your business. Uh, it can also be the purchase of other businesses. So it could be takeovers or brands. So uh, just recently we've heard that um, Asda and Sainsbury's are no longer merging because the, uh, the, the like commissioner, if you like, said that they weren't happy with the size of the company afterwards. Uh, so they've uh, they've disbanded it. Then investment is intended to help generate a return or profit over more uh, more than one year. So investment it could cost you money one year, then you might not see any like profit investment uh, on that investment until maybe the year after or the year after that. So two common investment objectives are level of capital expenditure. So in other words, set at either an absolute amount, so invest 5 million per year, or as a percentage of revenue. So 5% off your revenue every year will get put back into the business. Uh, that again would be looked at by the actual like shareholders if they want dividends back or not. Uh, returns on investment. So it could be usually set as a percentage of return, so calculated by dividing operating profit by the amount of capital invested. So in other words, they'll look at the operating profit and then just simply divide it by the, uh, the, the amount of money that they've actually invested back into the company, either through like uh, uh, buying new equipment or, or, uh, or sales, et cetera, et cetera. So when we're talking about capital, again, capital structure of a business, you've got to remember that capital is not just money. It is not just money itself. So capital of business represents the finance provided to it to enable it to operate over the long term. So the two ways of looking at this is equity, which is the amounts invested by the owners of the business. So things like share capital, retained profit, so money left over at the end of the year. Right. And share capital is where you sell your shares and you get money that way. Or there is debt. 
which is looking at things like bank loans or other long-term debt, so like mortgages. Uh, we'll be looking at more sources of finance where you can actually see that. And you can see that like share capital and retain profits don't really increase the debt of the business. I mean, like they are there already to use, whereas debt itself obviously will increase, uh, will actually be a part of the uh, the business's debt overall. So it's more of an external source of finance. So here's a couple of different capital structures. So we've got business A and business B. So business A, share capital, A, retain profits, B, and bank loan C and other loan capital. So you can see that business A has got 500 pound, uh, 500,000 in share capital. Uh, it's retained profits was 300,000. It's bank loans are 200,000 and it has zero other loan capital, which gives it a total capital of 1 million. Now this is made up of total equity A and B, which is 800, and then total debt is C and D, which is 200,000. Compare that to business B, where its share capital is actually just 300,000. Retained profits, it didn't hold as much back, 100,000, but it has had a big bank loan, so that's 500,000. And it's also got other loans up, up there as well. So that's 100,000. Now, even though they've both got the same total capital, so both businesses have got 1 million, then you can see that the debt is very, very different. Now, the total equity for business A is a lot more debt that, well, not debt, but it's uh, it's ra raised this capital without increasing its overall um, debt by too much, by just 200,000, right? And then obviously there's interest rates on top of that. Where business B has it's managed to hold some, but overall it is actually like, borrowed an awful lot of money and it's going to have to pay um it's going to have to pay interest rates on all of that so it is actually in a worse position so if we look at the overall like debt to equity ratio of those two businesses then you can see the business a its debt being 200,000 and its equity being 800,000 means that it has 25% of its like overall capital structure is debt which is you know pretty reasonable whereas if you look at business b then its debt is 600,000 its equity is 400,000 which means that even though this again these two companies have got 1 million in capital structure available then business b is in a far worse position because it's actually got 150% debt so it means that it is borrowing an awful lot more money than it has available in equity and it's relying on an, an outside source of finance, which means that it's going to have to pay interest rate. Uh, it's going to, the business itself is going to be at risk. So it needs to be really careful with it. Okay, so capital structure objectives. Now, really, we can sort of look at these in two different ways. So if you're looking for higher equity, then in your like uh, in capital structure so where you're actually looking to say right well i want there to be less borrowing outside the company so this could be where there is a greater business risk so like if it is a brand new startup company well you want to try and keep that debt down to a minimum because you are going to have to actually borrow anyway but it could also be where there's more flexibility required so in other words you don't have to pay dividends so if that's the case then you can make sure that your equity is going to be like set at a higher level because you're not having to pay out anyway uh, or if you're a startup you're just trying to keep it at as minimum a level as you can until you start making profit on the flip side though you've got reasons why having high levels of debt can actually be an objective it could be that interest rates are very very low so for example in the uk at the minute we're trying to encourage growth so in other words you might as well borrow because debt is so cheap at the moment to actually get if you're borrowing at like 0.75 percent then that's a hell of a lot better than if you're borrowing at five or 15 percent so it's a really good opportunity for you to actually borrow money not have to pay back much more than what you've already borrowed and this will mean that your investment should go a long way and also it could be where your profits and cash flows are strong so debt can be repaid easily so if you've got a lot of money coming in it's very regular uh, you're very profitable a business as well you've kept your costs all low well you might you can still borrow because you're going to be able to pay it back no matter what internal influences on financial objectives then 
So business ownership. So nature of the ownership has a significant impact. A venture capital investor would have quite a different approach to a long-standing family ownership. So if it's someone coming in wanting to do a bit more risk, then they're going to think very differently to someone who's had the business in like that as for years and years. And they would also think very different to uh, a startup entrepreneur. Size and status of the business as well. So startups and small businesses tend to focus on survival, break even and cash flow objectives. Let's get there before we actually aim for profit. Whereas big multinational businesses are much more on growing their shareholder value. So they are aiming for big profits and then what they can give out for dividends so that they can raise more share capital further down the line. Uh, and there are other functional objectives as well. So every other functional objective in a business has a financial dimension, which uh, often brings the finance department into conflict with those functions. So HR might be wanting to recruit people, but that is very costly. So how much can they actually give them? Operations may want new machinery, but can they afford to give them 3.4 million for one? Uh, marketing would love to have an infinite budget so that they can actually act, do whatever they want. But that again, that's not possible. External influences, however, we've got things like economic conditions. So, you know, we've got the example of the credit crunch, the economic downturn forced many businesses to reappraise their financial objectives in favor of cost minimization, maximizing cash flow and balances. So in other words, they were cutting costs, they weren't investing. And there are two ways of making money and that's profit like invest, in, invest money so that you make more sales, or you could cut costs and try and actually make more just in the profit side of it. Uh, significant changes in interest rates and exchange rates also have the potential to threaten the achievement of financial targets. So if you are borrowing money, but it's on a uh, flexible rate, then further down the line, that rate could go right the way up and you need to take that into account. Uh, competitors also have a big influence. So competitive environment directly affects the achievability of financial objectives. So cost minimi minimization may become essential if a competitor is able to grow market share because it is more efficient. You need to start following suit. And then social and political change. So often a, an indirect impact. So legislation on environmental emissions or waste disposal may force a business to increase investment in some areas and, cost, and cut costs in others. So if you look at McDonald's have had to invest a lot of money into uh, paper straws. Well, then we've got that change has come about, but you know, the plastic straws were still cheaper. Have they actually increased the money? yet to be seen. Uh, again, if we look at legislation with regards to the sugar tax, then we've seen the increase in Coca-Cola uh, prices, or we've seen the reduction in two litre, and now only a 1.5 is available. So again, this all needs to be taken into account. Right, thank you very much for watching. I know this has been a long video. Uh, for more information, just make sure that you give us a thumbs up and a subscribe uh, to Flippin' Heck Business. Leave constructive criticisms below and then video two will be following very, very shortly.